this point we ask, oh God, that you will express yourself. We don't ask for your presence because your presence is already here. We ask for a manifestation thereof. Breathe a fresh breath even upon us. We are gathered this morning not to see a man perform or hear a people sing. We are gathered to encounter your presence. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you because this will be the best moments of our lives. Receive all the praise and all the glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Your presence is heaven to us. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, are you glad to be in God's house this morning? (laughs) You see, anything is possible in the presence of God. I'm so excited because your life will never be the same again. I'm excited because one encounter with God is able to shift, shift the dynamics of your experience forever. Somebody's life is about to shift in the name of Jesus. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, it's about to shift. (laughs) Hallelujah. As it is our custom, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. If you have your Bibles, Go with me. I'm reading only one verse. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Are we all there? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Here begins the reading of God's word. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. I've been praying for you and this has been my prayer that he will give you a sign. (laughs) Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's where we are going to put the spotlight and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. The God that is not afar off. The God that is with us. This morning I'm going to begin a two-part message titled Cultivating the Presence of God. Cultivating <laughs> oh, the presence of of God by your heart I want to pray uh, it's one thing when a man speaks words another thing when a God does God speak your word inscribe it deep in the tablets of our hearts that we that we may shatter the old And its memory thereof, that we may embrace the new and its promises thereof. Ah, write your counsel on our hearts. I ask this morning that your word that is as a hammer will come forth and break the containers that have limited our progress. That it will come as a fire, that it will consume even the cloaks that have shrouded our increase. Break forth in our midst. Holy Spirit, Jesus, it's your turn now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hmm. I have an interesting task this morning. I have quite a bit that I need to communicate, but at the same time, I'm careful what I'm about to share because it's delicate. It's one of those messages that I was saying to the volunteer workforce that if there is ever going to be a message this year that I will need you to buy, it will be this one. And so please ensure the recording is done right. 
it will be this one. If there is a message that I will encourage you to buy and give to somebody, it will be this one. The Lord has said to us that this is the year of his presence. Another way to see it is the year of his face. Another way to see it is the year of his glory. Basically, then, it's the year of divine transformation. Please understand. Please understand. What will ensure, particularly in the context of, of the city of Zion, what will ensure that at the end of this year, you look back and you are able to say, that this was indeed the year of his presence is what I am going to share today. Meaning, if you don't understand what I'm going to share today, it is very possible, it is very possible, I pray it will not be your story, but it is very possible that you will reach the end of the year and you will say, but some people encountered him, why did I not? It's hinged on your understanding of today. So let's go. Think with me for a moment. I really will need you to think with me today. Uh, today, I will not be doing a lot of the work. You will have to work with me. So think with me. The children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, and they were supposed to be taken to the promised land. Somewhere along the line, they ended up in the wilderness. Whilst they were in the wilderness, watch this, whilst they were in the wilderness, um, uh, they were supposed to then face an enemy so that by defeating the enemy, they could occupy the land. It was part of the process for them to reclaim and claim their property. But fear stopped them. Fear stopped them from going into battle. So the, because of the fear that they had, uh, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. They saw the opposition as giants. It wasn't true. They exaggerated, which is what fear does. But because of their fear, they couldn't go into battle. Now, that is simple enough, but that's not my concern. My concern is what the angel said in Exodus 30. The angel that was leading them made a statement to them or concerning them in Exodus 30. The angel said that when he brought them out of Egypt, he could not take them straight into the promised land, not because he did not want to. He said he could not take them into the promised land, but instead had to take them through to the wilderness because if they saw war, they would be too afraid and they will go back to Egypt. Fear did not... Fear did not just stop them from entering the promised land. Fear also determined the options they were given. Let me say that again. Fear did not just stop them from entering the promised land. Even the options they were given, fear determined it. Meaning, even though, hear this, even though they thought they were choosing not to go into the promised land because of the giants, that decision not to go into the promised land because of the giant was not made the day they saw the giant. They had already made that decision before the giants appeared. The consequences of their actions was, was not, the decisions they made came from somewhere else. You will see why this is important. God help us. So, the choice of the wilderness wasn't purely out of divine providence, but also due to the consequences of their state of being. I need you to catch this. I said Exodus 30, which is actually Exodus 13, Exodus 13, verse 17. Your mindset, your belief system, or your consciousness, whatever term you choose to call it, doesn't just determine what you choose. It also determines the options you are given. This is extremely troubling. This could imply that many of your decisions, many of our decisions... Though they are consciously made, they are limited from the start. I need you to hear me. Two people could reach the same point, exact same point. Maybe they both love God. One person will take this way and succeed. The other person will take that way and not succeed. The one that fails to succeed will look back and say, but we both loved God. We were both in the same position. 
That's where I wanted to end up. God is unfair. Life is unfair. How come I ended up here? Then he will look at the, the other person that ended up there and say, that person got certain breaks that I did not. I need you to catch this. We we'll say that person got certain breaks. It's because this opportunity availed himself to them. That opportunity availed themselves to them. So they got these breaks, but I didn't get this break. That's why I couldn't end up there. What we don't see is that there was a reason why this person got those breaks. They were not lucky. They were not lucky. Who they were, their state of being, their consciousness, not conscience. I'm not talking about conscience. I'm not talking of even your subconscious. Their consciousness, their state of being determines determined the alternatives they will be given. It also determined the alternatives the other one will not be given. The angel did not want to take them through the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But the option for them to go straight into the promised land, they did not have the capacity to receive it. So it was never tabled. You will need to hear this again. Then it will make sense. Give you examples. There are certain levels of contracts that can't come and even if they do they can't stay not because God doesn't love us or because you don't desire it the options you are given are also determined by your state of being there are certain kinds of people that can't come talk less of being in a relationship with you even though that's what you desire why because your consciousness your overall belief system cannot accommodate that option. So the option cannot even be tabled. And so you keep seeing yourself saying, why, do I, why am I attracting the same thing, the same people, the same cycle? It is not the devil. He is not that powerful. Did you hear me? Stop binding devils that have already been defeated. It is not the devil. It is the state of your being. For the believer in particular, oh God, for the believer in particular, there is no devil anywhere that can overcome him. Jesus said, all power has been given unto me. When he said all, he meant all. I need you to hear this. It's going to get hot pretty quick. So there is a concern then. If decisions determine destiny, but your decisions are already primed or predetermined by your consciousness or mindset, then it becomes clear that this world we are living in, I'm about to say something very important. If you understand that the decisions you are making, They've already been primed. They've already been predetermined. Let me give you an example. Whether a man, if he's tempted by a woman, will sleep with her or not, is not going to be determined when he faces the temptation. That, that consequence has already been predetermined. It was not predetermined by God who had determined his destiny and determined that he will mess up here, but this one will succeed there. No. His state of being had already made that decision before he got there. When you understand this, you will then realize something. Everyone who has succeeded in anything has realized. This dimension of your existence is a realm of effect. It's a realm of consequence. It's not a realm of cause. Let me say it again. This dimension of our existence... If you don't get this, you will battle with relationships, you will battle with finances, you will battle with your health. This dimension of existence is purely a dimension of consequence. Even though you are making conscious decisions, it is still a dimension of only consequence. It is not a dimension of cause. 
the cause of your, of your life, current lifestyle and experience is not occurring here. See, there are people who don't know the Lord that have discovered this. And they walk in the light of it. My prayer is that you will understand this because the truth belongs to us. Are we together? The truth belongs to us. Until you are waking to the reality that many others have seen that events here are actually effects and not causes the, and, and embrace the fact that the cause lies elsewhere, we cede our power to unknown forces until we, are, we realize this. The choice, for example, let me skip, let me skip, let me get into some meaty stuff. Let me give you this illustration. I had to deal with this with somebody recently. This individual was living above his means. You know what, you know what that means, right? Was giving everybody the impression that they could afford this, they could buy this, they, they, they could have that. This was some time ago. They could have this, they had this, this was where they were in the strata, economic strata of life. When everything collapsed and they lost everything, or were about to lose everything, and we started a conversation, he had gone to meet a financial expert, and the financial expert put him on a program to balance his finances and to bring some discipline into his finances. They started the process, and the process looked like it was working. It really looked like it was working. He began to pay his credit cards off. He began, he began, he began. A few months, less than a year into the program, he went off the rail. The cycle started again. He was back to square one. He came through and we were having a conversation. We were saying, I've tried it. I thought it would work, but I've been unable to sustain it. I said, the reason is because, listen, for every individual, there is the thought, there is the thought process. There is the content, there is the container. When you focus on content and you ignore the container, saints hear me, and you ignore the container, whatever content you pour into it, because the container is compromised, is a matter of time. The eventual outcome will be compromised. See, even if, I said to him, even if you, he had succeeded in revamping his economic status, the reason for doing it, he had focused on managing the spending. Managing the spending was an effect. It was a consequence. It was not a cause. The cause was his low self-esteem. Because he was dealing with content. And for many believers, a lot of our confessions deal with content. They don't deal with container. And because that's the case, we battle. And you wonder why either it's not occurring or even when it occurs, it's unsustainable. Because you are dealing with content. But you are ignoring the container. Watch this. I said to him, even if he succeeded in revamping his financial status, the low self-esteem will birth another place of captivity in his life. And he will need another intervention because the container was still broken. For you as an individual, there's the realm of cause and effect. No matter the decisions you make here, this is still the realm of effect. Did you notice the same prophecy that was given to David about the Messiah coming from his loins was the same prophecy that was given to Saul. Many don't realize it. It was the same prophecy that was given to Saul, the king that preceded David. David pulled it off. Saul did not. Now this is, I need you now. David pulled it off. Saul did not. Why? When the, when the prophecy was given, please understand what a prophecy is. When a prophecy comes from the right source, 
It is a picture of your future. I need you to catch this. It is the mind, the mind of God that has seen your tomorrow and has come back into your today to tell you this is what your tomorrow looks like. Now, the thing is, if this is what my tomorrow looks like, and both, it was said to both of them, why did that tomorrow happen for David and not for Saul? Because unlike Saul, I don't have time to explain, but go read the life of Saul, just two chapters. Unlike Saul, David, uh, I have terms in my head that I suspect if I use, you would think I'm entering into Eastern mysticism. Because it's not. How do I say this? When you read the life of David, you will notice that the mind that saw his tomorrow and came to tell him, David remained in contact with that mind. How many of you understand that? So David talks about how he spent time in the presence of God. The Bible talks about how David wrote several psalms and a lot of the psalms. David will even say things like how he he has he he did not sleep so that he could have intercourse with that mind. David made statements like um, um, a man will will separate himself so that he can intermeddle with that level of consciousness, with that wisdom. David spent time with the mind that saw that future, but more so spent time with the mind that created that future. In doing so, in doing so, David met his future self. You will hear it again, it will make sense. In doing so, David met his future self, which was created by God. I need you to hear this. By that interaction, he got counsel from his future. He received counsel from his tomorrow, today. And it brought him into his tomorrow. Don't worry. The Spirit of the Lord is here. It will help you. It will help you. There is a level of thinking not just kind of thinking. There is a level of thinking that we need to graduate into. And with each level of thinking, with each level of consciousness you rise into, watch this, there are certain things that can no longer affect you. The same place with the rest of them, it affects these ones, it doesn't touch you. And you are not lucky. You are just operating from a consciousness that does not permit such effect. Are you listening to me? The ultimate level of thinking, the ultimate level of consciousness that any human being can ever attain is the God consciousness, is Christ. He's the epitome of man's existence. Some other people who have studied this will say the the, the ultimate consciousness is the consciousness of light. But when we think about who Christ is, that's why Christ himself said that he is the way. He is the truth. He is that light. He now says in John 1 that it's the light that cometh upon all men, that lighteth. It says he's the light that lighteth upon all men. He is the light. So Jesus, again, speaking of himself, he says he's the light of the world. When he says he's the light of the world, he wasn't just talking about he's the direction of the world. He was saying, I am the ultimate goal of everyone on the earth. If you are ever going to come to the place of pure peace and joy, I am the ultimate goal to arrive there. Many people who experience elevations in their understanding and progress One, if you don't meet the person 
you can never arrive there. When you begin to progress, and I'll give you some, some thoughts. When you begin to progress in, in, in levels of thought. Again, when I say levels of thought, I hope you understand what I mean. Belief systems. Consciousness. Who you are. Not what you have, not what you do. Who you are. When you begin to progress in those levels. At some point, if you follow the path that has been ordained divinely you will meet a man. I need you to hear what, did you hear me? You will meet a man and he will introduce himself as Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate light of the world. Let's continue. Let's continue. Someone asked me the question in a debate, is the Bible a book of truth? No, it's all truth in the Bible. I said, no. The Christians there went, <gasps> the Bible is not the custodian of all truth. Hear this. You can read the Bible and, for example, discover that gravity is 9.86. It's not there. You can't read the Bible and discover that if you don't eat, take calcium, your teeth will be weak. How many of you understand? The Bible is not the custodian of all truth. It is the standard of measurement of all truth. There's a difference between the two. It is the standard of measurement of all truth. Meaning, if you call something truth and the Bible refutes it, it is a lie. It is a lie. But this then implies that all truth is parallel. How many of you have heard that before? Let me explain. All truth is parallel. It means, let me use natural terms, then go into spiritual terms. In natural terms, it means if a mathematician calculates the acceleration due to gravity and arrives at 9.86, a physicist, and he calculates it here in Johannesburg, a physicist in Germany going through a different process will arrive at the exact same result. Why? Different process, exact same result. Why? All truth is parallel. If it's truth, it's the same. Do you understand? This is why you can read certain materials of people that don't know God. And as you are reading it, you are discovering things that Jesus said. Because truth is truth. Truth is truth. And there are pathways that people take to encounter truth as they begin to strip off erroneous consciousness so that they can walk in greater freedom. That's why Jesus now says that he is the way. Because any other path will not lead you to ultimate freedom. But it will lead you somewhere. But it's not ultimate freedom. I can't continue there. But let me say a few more things. I'm almost done. So, this then brings us to something very important. This is it. The tangibility of thoughts. Your thoughts are tangible. Saints, let me see. Ooh, I'm, I feel God all of a sudden. Your thoughts are tangible. If you do not accept that, you will remain in the rat race of life. Well, look, it is possible to operate in a certain level of consciousness in your finances and then in a lower level of consciousness in your relationship. So this one is rise and this one is useless. I need you to hear me. The idea, this is why Jesus was speaking and he says, you will know the truth and it will set you free. The word freedom there is soteria, which means total life freedom. His idea of freedom is that everything is free. Is that your health is operates in freedom your relationships are glorious your finances proper your mind sane how many of you understand this to get there you need to embrace the fact that your thoughts are tangible 
Jesus was speaking and he said that if a man looks at a woman to lust, watch this, looks at a woman lustfully, he says that he has already committed the sin. This implies that he will be judged purely for his thoughts. Meaning, from a certain dimension, his thoughts are tangible. From yours, you will say, I only thought about it. No, from where he stands, those thoughts are tangible. Your thoughts are tangible. Look, in Genesis chapter 1, a group of people came together to build a particular skyscraper with the technology they had then. The Bible says, in Genesis chapter 11, the Lord said, I, the angel said, I will come down to see not what the men are building. These men had only created it in their thought world. Watch this. He says, I will come to see what they have already built. Not I will come to see what they are building. I need you to understand, this realm is a realm of consequence. It is not a realm of cause. <sighs> so your thoughts are tangible. This is why you could think a thought and your blood pressure begins to rise. What's the connection? How? How is my thought affecting my blood pressure? Because your thoughts are tangible. Somebody tells you something. You are happy this moment. You hear news. Suddenly, you are sad. Not just sad. You begin to cry as if you are in physical pain. But all that happened was a thought was introduced. I need you to hear this. Thoughts are tangible. So, if you will be willing to embrace that, you're already en route to some crazy freedom. If thoughts are tangible, then thoughts are divided into two parts. The content, which is your conscious thought. Mm, this has a lot to do with what you do. And then the container, which is your consciousness. And this has a lot more to do with why you do it. Matthew 9, 17, Jesus says, Neither do men put new wine, what is new wine? Content. Into old bottles. What is old bottles? Container. Else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles and then both are preserved. When I talk about conscious thought and consciousness, remember, I'm not speaking about your subconscious. Your subconscious was actually birthed by your consciousness. You created your subconscious mind by your belief systems. Watch this. Let me echo this. When we deal with just content, we repeat cycles. The highest level of container or consciousness, the greatest level of belief is God's consciousness or Christ's consciousness, which is the realm of light. 1 Timothy 6.16 the Amplified Version says, speaking about God Almighty, it says, who alone has immortality in the sense of exemption from every kind of death? And this is speaking about God. He says, and lives in unapproachable light whom no man has ever seen or can see. Unto him be honor and everlasting power and dominion. The realm of everlasting light. Ooh, this is it. I will mention it but maybe next week we, will, we, we might delve into it. When we talk about the realm of light, God's realm, it's a timeless arena. There is no time. There is no future. There is no past. It is what we call the realm of now. Because he dwells in the realm of light, or what we call the realm of now, where he dwells, everything has already happened. So he can never be sad. I need you to hear this. He can't be sad. There are no events to change his mood. He's in the realm of light. He's in the realm of now. I need you to catch this. There are no events to either make him broke or more prosperous. He can't be more prosperous. He can't be broke. I need you to catch this. Where he dwells, everything has already been done. He is the best he could ever be. He is the best he has always been. 
<laughs> when a person enters into God's consciousness, when a person enters into our, our vision for the city of Zion is to bring everyone into a Christ consciousness. When a person enters into Christ consciousness, the person begins to realize that whatever is happening on the outside means absolutely nothing. As long as in the realm of thought or what some call the realm of the spirit, what we will call the realm of the spirit, the realm of your thought is the realm of the spirit. The spirit realm is, is your thought realm. That's the realm of, it's not some mystical place that God takes you into. Every time you think, you are in the spirit. This is why every believer or non-believer can operate in the spirit, in the realm of cause. Because certain people have realized this, watch this. Because certain people have realized this, even though they are not saved, they are able to go to the realm of causality, the realm of cause, and create options for you to follow. And then, for the unaware, we choose the options we are given, and we conclude that it was our choices. The game has been rigged. <laughs> the game has been rigged. And the Lord is saying, do not be a player do not, be, do not be that person who walks, who owns a ShopRite supermarket. And all he is doing is going to the shelf and taking stuff. Taking stuff as it's needed. But has no relationship with the production house. Because one day he will go to the shelf, it's empty. And he has no connection with where it is being produced. And so he begins to wither. This is a call. When he says a year of his presence, it's a call to the production house. I need you to hear this. It's a call to the production house. Do you know witchcraft operates at a certain level of consciousness? You can operate at another level of consciousness witchcraft you will not need to pray do you understand you will actually not need to pray someone will come and say to you they, they went someone went somewhere they took your clothes and they called your name at this particular sangomas or something and you will say is that all yeah. see hear me and they will it's not like you are trying to be to show bravado there will be no concern whatsoever whatsoever do you know why with all the witchcraft we say we have all the sangoma native doctor babalao as some countries call it powers that we say we have when the white man came why did it work they say they are going to meet sangoma look when i was in school we had boys who were going to meet sangomas they were called they were in cults secret cults and we we're going to meet sangomas to give them powers to resist bullets. And some people were of the opinion that they could do it. And that they actually received the powers to do it. Whether it's possible or not, I don't know. I know that in Christ all things are possible. Okay? But the truth is, if those things were really that powerful, when the white man came with his guns and was shooting, we, we were dying. Right now, every Sangoma will tell you that the current, the current methodology of Sangoma uh, skill sets, whatever, is inferior. That they had the more, in my, in my, in my parlance, and we say, Ogunge, it means uh, the real deal. That the one that they're operating under now has, has gone through a lot of, you know, it's, it's been watered down. The real one did not protect. What am I driving at? I told you last week, the presence of God has doors. It has doors. With each door you enter, you break a container, and your content is poured into a new one. 
In that new container, there are new experiences. It will look like you didn't go anywhere and you will not have to have gone anywhere. But suddenly, the, the things, the options that will suddenly begin to present themselves, you will marvel. And you say, it's still the same me in the same company. But suddenly, I have found favor. What you have found is an elevation of consciousness. You are getting closer to the real you. And the real you, the ultimate you, is the person, the man Jesus Christ. Ha. You will need to hear this. Let me close with this. If we spend our time, if we spend our time dealing with effects, ignoring the cause, at the end of this year, we would have repeated the same story. And if you have made progress, minimal. How do we deal with causes? Let me give you an example of causes. The things I'm about to mention are containers. Forget, forget the fact that you are struggling with pornography. That's content. It's not the real problem. Forget the fact that you're struggling with managing your emotions and you have an anger problem. Content. It's not the problem. Forget the fact that you don't know how to manage money. You know, there are some people that say when money comes, you see it. Then abracadabra. <laughs> you don't see it. And you don't know what you did. These days, it doesn't really happen. You know what happened. It's debit orders. But, you know. <laughs> but you don't even know what you did. Content. If we do not begin to step back from just facing content and deal with container issues, even when you are introduced to new content, you will battle to embrace it. You will battle. When new content was introduced to the children of Israel saying, let's go into the promised land, let's fight the enemy, they said, you must be mad. Because their container could not contain that information. Examples of content. No, con container. Fear is a container. It's not... It's, it look, there are consequences as a result of fear, but the container, fear is a container. This is why... 366 times in the Bible we are told do not be afraid. Do you know 366 times in one way or the other you are told not to be afraid. It is God's attempt to help you crack the container. And because of fear there are so many things that are birthed. So many. Do you know did the, let me give you another one. Another container very important container is so should I? Remember when Eve ate of the fruit? The, what she did wrong was not the eating of the fruit. The eating of the fruit was effect, consequence. What was the cause? The devil said to her, you are not like God. I paraphrase. The devil compromised and questioned her understanding of self-worth. The minute he took her self-worth, she acted like the person that had no self-worth. She acted like somebody who needed to do something to feel worthy. So a lady sat in front of me and said, I don't know why every time I'm in a relationship, I keep sleeping with the guy. I, I, I've tried. Hey, when we get into a relationship, so I decided I won't date any any." Uh, unbeliever, I would date only Christians, but even Christian men want sex, you know, and so I don't know what to do. I said, listen, the battle you are facing is that you think the problem is the sex before marriage. Somebody else in your situation will not battle that. Why? Let's go into the container. As we began to probe, we saw her sense of self-worth had been broken. And we saw when it happened. 
that was when the container was fractured. And because that container was fractured, from that point, there was now a pursuit to gain it back. To gain it back. I said, for as long as you think the problem is the sex, the enemy is blinding you from the real problem. And that, that lower level of thinking will keep you battling here and battling here. It will also determine the kind of men that will come there. You'll be surprised. It's the same kind. Of course it's the same kind. It's the same you. I'm out of time. Stand. Why is this important for us to settle before we enter into the actual step-by-step of cultivating his presence? You need, we need to settle this because you must have first affirmed in your understanding that your thought, your thought is tangible. That your thought is the realm of the spirit. And there are several spirits there. Do you, do, you know why, do you know why an individual you've never met, both in the kingdom and outside the kingdom, can tell you stuff about yourself? I've had people do it to me. They will tell you stuff about your past. Do you know why? Listen, in the realm of thought, in the realm of that consciousness, in the realm of the spirit, everybody is present. Saved on saved, everybody appears there. And those who have learned how to, who have opened their mind to understand that my thought is the realm of the spirit, will begin to see other people there too. We are all there. We are not all victims there, <laughs> but we are all present there. What we will do next week is how to translate that thought. Now that you know that every time I think I'm in the spirit, how do I then make the man who's also there, his name is Christ, how do I make him tangible to me? Because listen, the more tangible Christ becomes to you, the Bible says when we see him as he is, we become like him. The more tangible Christ becomes, the more you are, when, when, when you say God is here, it's no longer abstract because you have done some of the things I will explain to you next week. You've done it. So when you say God is with me, God is my Emmanuel, it's not abstract. You actually sense him with you. The more he becomes real, as your five senses, as everything everyone else is to you, the more you will manifest at his level. The battle, the battle is to bring that, con- that, that tangibility of his presence to your, con- to your content. Do you understand? As in taking it and pouring it into your content. Because of the way that consciousness is, it will revamp the container. I need to do something important. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Mm